Hi, this is Annie from the University of Chicago Alumni Career Services. Thank you so much for joining us for the first part of our three-part series, Planning and Executing the Mid-Career Job Search with Marilyn Motes Kennedy. Um, Marilyn is an accomplished professional in the world of work. She was a DePaul faculty member for 11 years during which she pushed her students to think through their job searches and achieve more. She also founded her career advising company, Most Kennedy Inc. in 1975, and since then she's been advising clients, both organizations and individuals on a wide array of topics, including cross-generational issues in the workplace, getting 20-somethings on board, and aging in retirement. She's been the job strategies editor for Glamour Magazine for 18 years, has authored six books, and is a sought-after international speaker. So we are so thrilled to have Marilyn here with us today. Uh, for today's first part of the Mid-Career Job Search series, we're going to focus on what do you want next? How to visualize the job you want and sell yourself for that specific opportunity. So I'm going to hand it over in just a minute, but first I want to remind everyone that you can ask questions. Just use the chat box that is on the right-hand side of your screen at the bottom of that dashboard. And go ahead and type your question in there and then use the drop-down to send the question to staff. I'll be keeping an eye on those questions and I'll interject periodically to ask Marilyn what she thinks. So without further ado, I'm handing it over to Marilyn. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're here today to talk about mid-career job hunt. And here is our problem. Most people spend more time on the mechanics than they do on what is the single most important issue in a job hunt, what do you want to do next? And we're going to spend significant time on that today because it is the most important thing. If, you, if someone says to you, what do you want to do, and you cannot answer in 18 words or fewer, you have a problem. What I hear people saying is generalities. Oh, I want to be in finance. I looked this up because I thought it was interesting. There are 7,000 job titles under the heading finance. This is not specific. So what we need to talk about is how you find a specific job title or how you describe the job that you want to do next. We don't care what you might want to do 20 years from now because we're not even sure that's been invented yet. What we care about is what do you want to do next. There are, as Richard Bowles identified 40 years ago, three issues in job hunting. One, what skills do you want to use? Second, what kinds of organizations are you looking for? And the third is, how do you find those organizations and get hired? When we talk about the prequel, which is the planning part of the job hunt, what we're interested in is, what skills do you want to use? The fact that you can do something, that you can do hundreds of things, while interesting is not definitive, because no employer cares about all that you can do, only what it is you want to do for that organization. How do you describe your skills? There's a difference between skills and experience. Experience is how you use the skills, but the most important thing is, what are the skills? And you can't say, well, I'm a really good writer. Okay, but what do you write? You can't say, I'm a really good negotiator until you tell us what you negotiate. Or being uber specific is the most important part of your job hunt. It's the beginning, the planning stage. Many people choose organizations based on what burned them last. This is really not a good idea. The fact that you worked for a company that was ruthlessly run by dreadful people doesn't matter. That doesn't mean your next employer should be a not-for-profit. They're very different. They have very different kinds of organizational politics. They have different ways of thinking about mission, vision, all of that. So what you need to think about is what would be the best fit with my personality? I hear people say, in fact, I almost never hear them not say, I can get along with anybody. That is patent nonsense. You cannot get along with anybody. You are going to be more compatible with some people and less compatible with others. It is very important 
to say, what kinds of people do I get along with best, instead of saying, how can I adapt myself to what may be a hostile environment? One thing that doesn't get talked about in a job hunt, and I do want to talk to you about it, is what are your constraints? Every year I see people, particularly writers, who say, I want to work for a magazine, but I want to stay in Chicago. Well, then you're going to start your own online magazine. New York City, and only three or four blocks, is magazine Nirvana. Or I want to make movies, but I want to do it in Chicago. Mm, I don't think so. In Chicago, there are 30 production companies in Los Angeles on one mile of La Cienega Boulevard, there are a thousand production companies. So when we talk about constraints, it's more important to identify your constraints than it's ever been. You don't want to end up looking for love in all the wrong places, trying to do something that can't be done here, and then saying to yourself or to your family, well, you see, it really couldn't be done. That's not the point. It couldn't be done here. So what we're interested in is how do you find, identify, and sort of nail down what it is that you want to do. And there are a number of really helpful tools. I will give you some of the easiest ones. The one that has been most successful, particularly for mid-career changers, is called the Million Dollar Lottery Win. Here's how it works. You must enter into your own imagination for this. You won $250 million in a Powerball lottery. You now have to go through and say, what am I going to do with that money? And we know from having interviewed people who won big lottery wins that there is a three-step process. The first step is they indulge themselves. What would you buy if money were no object? Second, they do good. Oh, now I'm going to give money to cancer research. I'm going to give money to um, some other cause that I really am interested in. But here's the part that never gets into the press but should be important to you. After they've done all these things, they tend to go back to work because they have made an important discovery. All of the interesting people in the world are busy between 9 and 5, and the people that are left to play with are either gaga or not your sort. So what we looked at was 85% of these people, after they've indulged themselves, after they've done good, they go back to work. But only about 20% of them go back to the job they had before. That's why this exercise can help you. If you think about it, you can go through this in your mind and you can say, there is something here that I want to do and that I want to personally deliver the service. That is Eureka. That is what you are looking for. You will not be able to sit down one evening and do this. You will need to think about it. You can't short circuit this exercise. You can't say, oh, I don't really care what I'd buy. I don't really care who I'd help. I'm just going to go for what I want to do. It's not going to work for you. All of the great thinking and the smart thinking in career planning begins with one of three issues. What did you want at 17 before anybody talked you into or out of the career you wanted? What was it that you wanted to do? The way to discover this is to go back and do what we call a work autobiography. Go back to high school. What ways, what activities did you have for making money then? Maybe you really did like to work for McDonald's. I've had any number of people who remember fondly their high school minimum wage job. Now, my question to you is, you remember them, but what did you like about them? What was the thing that made it compelling? Was it working with people? Was it seeing progress? These are issues you absolutely have to sort out. There is no way that you can jump from this is what I did yesterday to this is what I did, I will do tomorrow with any kind of success. What would you want to do if money were no object? 
And here is the thing that I want to talk to you about right now, up front, even though we're going to get to salary negotiation later. The thing to remember is people are making money doing all kinds of things that you would think they couldn't. And here's why. Think about human, re human resources. There are people making zero money, zero money, I mean very little money in human resources. And then there are people making six figures, doing exactly the same job. What is the difference? It's the context. If you're recruiting for a sand and gravel company, you're not going to make the same money as someone doing executive search, retained executive search. But it is exactly the same skill set. Exactly the same skill set. What you need to say is, are the activities important to me? Are these things that I really would enjoy doing because I've done them in the past and I know that I can do them and I enjoy them? How would you sell yourself into an executive search firm? More about that later. But let's make sure that right now what you are interested in is something that has had a long-term interest for you. When we talk about skill sets, a skill set is nothing more than what you do and how you do it and the context in, when you, in which you do it. When we look at skills, we're not talking about more skilled or less skilled. We're talking about a set of activities. So let's say that the skill set that you like most is that which is involved in management consulting. That should be fairly simple to work out. You would be able to find online, and particularly on LinkedIn, the resumes of all kinds of people doing management consulting. All you need to do is to say, what are they saying about this field that I need to be saying about it? When we talk about organization, I want to remind you that the mythology of organizations does not match the reality. Not-for-profits are not more humane than businesses. And I will tell you why. In a business, we're in pursuit of money, and there are certainly strengths certain things we can't do in the pursuit of money. But in not-for-profits, we're doing good. There is no limit to the things we can do and the rules we can bend in pursuit of goodness. So you need to understand what those differences are. What is the difference between big and small? It doesn't matter unless there is a difference in the size of the unit you'd be working in. If you work with three other people for craft, or you work with other people for Acme Startup, there is no difference. So be careful when you characterize what you want in terms of size or in terms of goodness or for-profit or not-for-profit. When we talk about these issues, one of the things that I mentioned before, but I want to give it significant time, is constraints. People would love to do things, for instance, work for an art museum. Now you must know that the only people in an art museum who make money are the people in development. Curators are expected to do it for love unless they are part of the fundraising effort. So what you need to think about is how much money do you need? What is your bottom line? If you still need to work for money, you have to factor that into your thinking. Now there are ways to get around that. You can say, okay, in my full-time job, I will take less, but I will moonlight in my old business to make up the difference. We talked for a bit about relocation. What I have found is wherever you are tends to be where you want to be. And the idea of relocating to the east or west coast, to the south, anywhere. Right now, some of the greatest job opportunities exist in Colorado, in North and South Dakota, because of the energy that is available there, gas, uh, shale, that sort of thing. Would you be willing to live in North Dakota for lots of money? And if not, that's OK too. But don't you think you ought to put that into your thinking? Not tell yourself, well, sure, if I got the right job offer, I'd leave and go there. Because my experience is 
you wouldn't. Full-time versus part-time. People say, oh, I just want a part-time job. Wait, not so fast. What does full-time mean? And what does part-time mean? My experience has been that people who say, I will take a half-time job 20 hours a week, end up working 30 to 35 for 20 hours a week's worth of money. People full-time may be working 65 or 70 hours. So it's important to know what you think those terms are and if you can control it. Employers have a tendency to believe that if they give you a flexible schedule, you'll be willing to work at least 20% harder. Is that true? Because if it's not true, you need to know that up front. I can tell you that right now in the job market, there are two trends that are going to make a huge difference. One is we're seeing large numbers of women returning to work who are not going to be sharing jobs. What they're going to be doing is working a job as preparation for either self-employment or another career. The other trend we're seeing is people in their 60s and 70s, up to age 75, are much more interested in sharing a job because one of them works three days one week and two days the next week. The company knows the job is always covered. It is almost like one foot in retirement. But again, if you are wildly ambitious or you think that you're going to have a huge impact in the workforce, that's probably not going to work for you. Because part-time, even if it's a job share, is not going to do for you what full-time work would. Finally, self-employment. The third biggest trend we're seeing is people in their 50s and 60s are going to work for their children. This is an honorable thing. Stephen Jobs' mother worked for him in the early part of Apple. Bill Gates' father worked for him. It becomes an issue of do you want to be part of the next generation of a family business? Are you going to strike out on your own? There are only three rules for self-employment. Number one, go to SCORE, take their courses, they're all free. SCORE is the Service Corps of Retired Executives. They have an office in every town. The help, the quality of the people that work with you are, is just outstanding. Second, do you have an idea that you believe could make money? Or at least break even, it doesn't have to make money. Money is one of the choices you get. Third, and this is the most important thing, can you really be alone most of the time? I hear all the time from people who've gone out, and this is a great time to be an entrepreneur, they have done wonderful things, they've gotten a business up and going, they're making money, and bang. After three years, they sell it. And why do they sell it? Because they spent way too much time alone. The number one determinant of whether you can be self-employed or not is not the quality of your idea, it's can you work alone. And people-oriented people have a hard time with that. Now, there are several new ways to do that that I just want to point out so that if you are a people person, you won't be discouraged. Incubators are a wonderful thing. There's a new one at the Merchandise Mart in Chicago for tech startups called 1871. It is a fabulous space. It covers a whole floor of the Merchandise Mart. All these young entrepreneurs, and not so young ones, there are several that I eyeball personally in their 50s, they have the benefit of both being part of a startup and having people around them. If that's what you're thinking about, and even if you're not in Chicago, consider working with an incubator and it would make the transition easier. It's also important to start whatever it is you want to start part-time, see if it works before you go full-time. Nothing will cause you to make worse business decisions than being frightened that you can't make it and you've already left your full-time job. All the successful people that I know who had startups did it part-time, usually for 12 to 18 months, until they could pay themselves enough to go full-time. 
Sure. If you are 22 and living at home with your parents, that's a different scenario. But if you are mid-career, self-employment becomes an option only if you can transition. When we talk about other constraints, one of the things that isn't a constraint is what your family thinks. Your family has a different agenda. They're worried about what's going to happen to them. They're worried about what happens if you are really miserably unhappy. Don't get into the details with family or friends. Tell them you're exploring options and that you'll get back to them when you have something concrete to say. Do not worry about what your former colleagues in your company will say. Understand that these people will consider you a hero. They always wanted to get out of there and do something else. It's just that they didn't know what to do. If you are looking for, and this is a very old technique, this is from John Holland from after World War II. John Holland was instrumental in helping returning soldiers who had never had any work experience, they went directly by draft into the war effort, decide what they wanted to do. And here is what he concluded. It is not foolproof, but it's certainly worth your time. You need to see what kinds of people you hang around with and what they do. It is well known that writers hang around with other writers. It's well known that consultants have war stories they want to trade only with other consultants. So it becomes a matter of looking around you and saying, who are the people that I have the most personal and personality compatibility with? I know this sounds silly. It works every time. You will find that there's a certain group of people that you share both temperament and skill sets with. All right. Here we are. We haven't got yet an 18-word summary of what you want to do next, but we've got two or three things that we need to consider. Two or three things that sound really attractive. If you've got more than two or three, or let me be very definite about this, if you've got more than three, you are not ready to go to the next step. You are still in the position of trying to decide what it is you really want to do. I do not advise trying to do four or five different searches going off in four or five different directions because you'll go crazy. Clinically speaking, you can't manage that much information. You can't manage that many different contacts. You've got to prioritize what is number one that you're most interested in, number two, and if you must, number three. Here is a secret. You will be amazed that what you've chosen, you also have probably 60 to 70% 70, 70 of the skills to do. How could that be? Because we're talking about temperamental compatibility. You like the kind of people that do this particular job. You like the environment. You like the tasks. You like the skills that you use. Therefore, it is not going to be a leap the size of the Grand Canyon for you to convince people you're qualified. The greatest fear job hunters have is that you will show up for a live interview with someone who could hire you to do the job you want to do, and the person will say, but you're not qualified. That does not happen. That is a job hunter fantasy. It does not happen. Why doesn't it happen? Because the number of people who would go from accounting to acting is probably one-tenth of one percent. And if they were going from accounting to acting, they would have done summer stock, they would have done uh, community theater, they would have something to put on a resume before they showed up for the main chance or the big audition. When you look, and you do have a resume, I know you do, we're going to rewrite it, but not now. Look at your resume and say, why were you qualified to do the job you had? Or why are you qualified to do the job you have? Is it? And these all get priority. Industry knowledge, you know how the job is done. You know why in your industry it's necessary. Is it the skills 
that you have that you just applied in this one field, but you could apply in others. Third, are the people that you work with similar in background and education to you? That's important because the more the more differences between you and the people in your preferred field, the more you're going to have to do some updating. You're going to have to work at making yourself more qualified. But now here is another secret. How long do you have to do something to master it? There's a friend of mine who used to say, people would say to him, Lee, his name was Leland, Leon Kaiser, and say to him, Lee, how long will it be before I can do this? And his response was, how quickly can you change your mind? Once you change your mind and decide this is what you're going to do, you're going to be able to figure out what it takes to do it. Did you ever think that maybe all the people who resist the social media resist because they really don't want to learn how to use it? I think about that quite a bit. Um, when we talk about constraints, there's one more. And I think this one needs some thought on your part. Change is very painful. And people who want to change careers sometimes don't realize they're going to feel pain. And what happens to them, and if this happens to you, you need to think about it. They're job hunting. They are talking to people, and especially if they are out of work at the time, they will say such things as, I probably will never get hired because all those people in the workplace are more competent than I am. If you get into this syndrome of thinking everybody's more qualified, I want you to go back and think about your last job. At least 20% of the people you worked with could not pound sand in a raffle. They were only there because they had superior political skills that would allow them to hang on, and people liked them. They were inoffensive. But their whole skill set was political. They had no hard skills. It's important for you to remember that you've got to learn at least 30% or you've got to learn new material 30% of the time on your new job. It must be a stretch. What is different about the job you want from your last job? There are three things that could be. One is it's a different set of people. The second is it's a different focus. You're using many of the same skills, but instead of using them to uh, move a product forward, you're delivering a service. The third difference could be the people you serve, that is, the clientele, is very different. Any of those seems like career change. It really isn't. When you're talking about true career change, it's about 10% of all job changers. All career changers really make a true career change. That would be from accounting to acting. They go from medicine to manufacturing. They go from delivering a service to making a product. So before you say, wow, this is going to be really tough, ask yourself, how is the job I want different from the one that I have now or the last one I had? Don't take a job that's a slam dunk. I know this is premature, but I want you to think about this. If you take a job that is beneath your skill level or that isn't a stretch, you're going to be bored to tears in six months, sometimes three months. depends on how far down. Also, if someone says to you, you know, you're really overqualified for this job, don't be offended. What the person is saying or trying to say but doesn't have really the concept to do it is, raise your sights. You're aiming too low. We know because we've hired people like you in this job and they're bored to tears in three months. That's why there, you must always have a learning component. Now, what if the company won't hire anybody who hasn't done the job for 10 years? Then you don't want to be there. 
one of the most telling moments came with a client who said to me, I was in an interview today, and the person said, so, you've been with blank company for 10 years. Does that mean you have 10 years experience or one year's experience repeated nine times? You don't want to be there. It was a telling moment. It was a Kodak moment. It was also an awful moment. So we're going to have to look up and say, how do I use what I've got to build and to move into this job, but not do a pure lateral move? Because you do not want to do that. OK, what are your needs? What do you really need to do to be competitive? Well, there's a couple of things. How are you going to know what being competitive means unless you interview people doing the job you want to do? And where are you going to find those people? Well, the number one place would be a trade or professional society. If I wanted to know what actuaries do, I would go to the local meeting of the Association of Actu the Society of Actuaries, SOA, and I would interview people. It's the only way to find out what people really do. Before I enrolled in any courses, and everybody loves to take courses, it's the thing that they think they do best. We're all good learners. I need to know what I really need to know, and only interviewing is going to give me that. Now, we're going to do this for the rest of our careers, which is be part of trade and professional societies. So we might as well get a grip on what that means. There is no job that does not have a trade or professional society associated with it. You name it, and it's got one. Identify it, track them down, and go. Now, here's the problem. I don't really love people. I don't want to go into a group of strangers and start glad-handing them like some ersatz politician on speed. I can't do that. If I go there and I don't know anybody, I will stand in the corner and I will talk to the bartender, who probably is one of the more interesting people there. That's another story. What I need to do is when I check in, I told these people I'm coming, I found out when the meeting is, I called someone, maybe the membership chair, and said, I'd really like to come to a meeting, but I don't know anybody there. Could you have a member of the hospitality committee introduce me to some of the members? Well, yes, of course, they all have a hospitality committee, but most people don't even ask. You've got to ask. And when you check in, say, I talked to the membership chair, and she said, or he, that a member of the hospitality committee would introduce me to some of the members. It's that simple. And that person will turn out to be someone who's very garrulous and can break in to little groups of two and three and introduce you. Unless you do that, there is no point in going to an association meeting. And there's no point in trying to figure out what these people are all about, because you can't read about this. You actually, you actually have to experience it. No one ever died from lack of banquet food or speakers at association meetings. It's the members that we want to meet. And don't sit down at a table, wait and see who sits down, and then sit down at a table where you see there are people and companies you're interested in. Now we need to update our skills. We know what needs to be done. How do we do that? We can do it two ways. We could take a course that is really chancy. I'm not sure you're going to find a course that exactly does what you need done. Or you could find a mentor. What is a mentor? A mentor is nothing more than a teacher. It's why alumni associations exist. You should be able to contact some of the people you knew in school. Yes, I know you've been out 30 years. It doesn't matter. And say, look, here's what I need to know. And this is the most important question of job hunting. Who should I be talking to? Think about it. Don't say, who knows this? Say, who should I be talking to? Just as if you were asking about a job, you wouldn't say, have you heard of any openings? Because of course, when you ask me that, I can't remember. What you would say to me is, who do you know that I should be talking to? And that's an easy pass off. I can pass you off to someone 
that I know is in that field, that's the job you want to do. However, when you talk about mentoring, that is a $5 word or $0.25 cent concept. Most mentors answer questions. They talk to you over coffee and tell you what they think. It is not necessarily an ongoing process. It is not the old godfather mentor of the 70s and 80s in which a senior executive takes you under his or her wing and helps your career. We're not looking for that. We're looking for information. We're looking for what is the shortcut to learning what I need to know as quickly as possible. Every time I talk to job hunters, and I spend a lot of time with them, I have to hear about how they're handicapped. What are their handicaps? They're not beautiful. They're not young. They're not the smartest person on the block. That describes most of the human beings in the world. But it definitely describes the employed human beings in the world. And since that's what you want to be, let's talk about what you see as handicaps. You're not beautiful. You're not young. Those are assets. Let me tell you a couple of stories that I think will give you a clue. I have a client age 62 who just doubled her salary. She relocated from Chicago to New Jersey. And she is in a very high level kind of statistics, which escapes me. Why did she get that opportunity at age 62? Because the two previous people in the job were in their 30s. One of them announced that she did not dig the scene in New Jersey. The second one said she wasn't a morning person and she didn't want to get up. She wanted to freelance so she could work all night if she wanted to. My client went in with her excellent work ethic, her desire to show up early for work every day. It was a slam dunk. In other words, the smartest job hunting strategy is to be counterintuitive. If you think that the company wants only young people, you need to march in there and ask a few questions, such as, I see you have a great many young people around here. What kinds of role models and mentors do you supply? You've just changed the dialogue. You are not old. You are valuable. Another handicap. I can't travel. OK? Then wouldn't it make sense to look for those companies that are headquartered in wherever it is you, is, you are, so that your travel would consist of the annual meeting of whatever association they belong to, and maybe once on the road every two or three months. If they say 10% travel, it's 30%. If they say 50%, it's 80%. So you have to really screen out those companies that are trying to get you to travel way more than you can. Other handicaps. I'm undereducated. I'm overeducated. I get a lot more people who are overeducated. I have three degrees. OK. That's not a handicap. What it is is a selling proposition. And when you talk to your um, interviewer, you need to say, it took me a while to sort out what I really wanted to do. So therefore, I did a lot more things in terms of education than I had before. So what I want to do is to tell you how committed I am to making a success of this skill set. So we had a question, when, you, when the, the employer is pretty stuck on wanting every single requirement in their long, long list, how do you overcome that handicap when there's just maybe a good percentage of things that you don't have, uh, maybe perhaps computer skills, things that you could potentially learn very quickly through a couple of courses, how do you make that sell? The most important thing is to ask the potential employer to prioritize or to do a pie chart of what percentage of the job is each one of these skills uh, is necessary for. And what I found is you can show you can do 75% of the job once the employer identifies what the parts of the job that are most important. For instance, you've got, you don't have wonderful computer skills. Is that really necessary? And if so, what would be the first time, potentially, that you would need PowerPoint. 
what would be the first time that you would need Excel? It's important not to be, to just be flattened by a question like that. Well, you've only got, you don't have all the skills you need. But to pursue that and say, well, prioritize these for me. What is the guts of the job? What kinds of skills do I need to be using and do I need to master in order to be effective in this position? Maybe you can't be. Maybe it is way too technical, but I'm going to bet that what has happened is the employer put together a list, an idealized list. I want someone who can leap tall buildings in a single bound. I want somebody who's as good as a computer engineer because everybody puts together that list. It's like your wish list. What you have to do is convince them that you can do a better than reasonable job of fulfilling their expectations without all those extra skill sets that they think you need. When we're talking about handicaps, the one thing that is not in and of itself is a handicap is your age. You will find that right now more companies are looking at boomers. Those are people born between 1946 and 1959. Are looking at them more favorably because of the perception out there that many younger people lack the work ethic the company would like them to have. What is this work ethic they're talking about? Hold to the end of the row, work to the end of the job, face time. If you leave before the boss, that's something of a problem in your if you're uh, not a boomer, you can amaze people at how well you could do the job if you do two things. One, would you consider a portfolio? I have one. Everyone I know has one that shows some of your past successes. It may be an award you got. It may be a letter from your boss saying, we could never finish that project without you. You can bring copies of those things and leave them with a prospective employer. Why doesn't everybody do this? Because they think it's too much trouble. When you're changing careers, nothing is too much trouble. You want to be sure that you present the best case for yourself that you possibly can. Okay, let's talk about networking. Everybody talks about it. They all claim to do it. It is not true. LinkedIn is the only one of the social media that I think is really important for job hunters. You need a really good biography of yourself, resume, up on LinkedIn. And you need to be sure that you only talk about the things you're willing to do on your next job. So many people say, I'm going to tell you everything about myself, even the things I never intend to do again. Please don't do that. Because you will invariably attract a potential employer who wants you to do the very things you don't want to do. We talked about trade and professional association. Listen, it would not kill you to attend a monthly meeting of your trade or professional society. And here's your goal. Very simple. After you've gone around and been introduced to some of the people, you will greet 10 people at that meeting every time you go. They can be the same people. I'm not even going to make you greet new ones, but you've got to greet 10 people. In other words, we are carving uh, a trail on the frontal lobe of the people in this association because they are your potential lead givers and employers. Your alumni association, the most underused group in the world. If anyone is going to return your call, it's going to be a fellow alum. Think about it. I think that the group that's most neglected and most obvious is for former coworkers. Everybody you worked with in your last job, even if they closed the company, laid them all off, is going to turn up somewhere. You've got to keep email addresses. You've got to be in touch with those people. How much in touch? Once every three months if you are just doing maintenance. Once every month if you are in an active job search. 
what about friends and friends of friends? You are more likely to get a job that way than any other way. In the olden days, people got jobs because they showed up at church or synagogue once a week and people got to know them and there was networking that went on there. Not so much now, but you can actively network via email. You won't have to be there in person except for trade and professional associations and I recommend the alumni associations as well. If you don't plan on and court some visibility, you're making it harder on yourself. And if you're ever going to be accepted anywhere, it seems to me the trade and professional associations and the alumni associations are going to be your best sources. Now, if you show up there and work the room, as I said, like some crazed politician, it's not going to work for you. But everybody at some point is going to sit next to somebody and you can always ask that question. Here's what I'm looking for. Who should I be talking to? It will never fail you because that's how we store information. When you think about networking, what are the numbers? Here's the way the numbers run. Out of every 400 active contacts you have, you can expect to generate 10 to 12 live job leads, 8 interviews, and 2 offers. That is our nirvana. More than anything, I want you to have a choice of job. I do not ever want to see a job hunter saying, oh, well, this is the only offer I got. Well, then you didn't do it right. You've got to generate more than one offer. Otherwise, you will be dissatisfied very quickly. It isn't just that you are talking to people, that you are out there and you're visible. It's that you are also suggesting opportunities for other people. Remember, you only need ultimately one job, the next job. So couldn't you be introducing people to the jobs you don't want? If you seek people out and say, hey, I heard about an opening at XYZ, and I don't know if you're interested, but if you're not, maybe you know someone with, that person never forgets you, particularly not now. They might have 20 years ago, but right now in this, the Great Recession, although I think we are coming out of it, they're going to be interested and they're going to remember that you thought of them. You can do this by email. You don't even have to pick up the telephone. In fact, in many ways, email is the preferred form of networking right now. But now, and this is really important, you can't network until you know what you're looking for. You can't just be out there saying to people, hi, I'm here, this is what I did last, but I don't know what I want to do next. The preparation before networking is what gets you taken seriously by your network. If you say, oh, I don't know what I want to do, or you give a broad base, oh, I'm interested in advertising. What is that? In today's market, there's a thousand jobs in advertising. You've got to be more specific. I'm interested in some form of finance or I'm interested in marketing. Marketing is my favorite because it has expanded the most over the last 20 years. So when you are thinking about networking, remember that networking can't start until you have something to talk about. You have a story. I also want to tell you that any time you spent on an elevator speech is dreadful and awful and nobody wants to hear it. Don't do it. You've got to be authentic and authentically you or it's not going to work. So if you say, oh, I'm the sort of person who does, don't do that. Answer the question. What do you want to do? Second question is, why are you qualified? Here's some of the things I've done in this field. And third, this is the kind of organization I'm looking for. None of the little issues, such as the size of the organization, for-profit or not-for-profit, are nearly as important as do they have the kinds of jobs that you're interested in. If they're not, if it's the most prestigious company in the world, let it go because it's not going to work for you. On, oh, yes, between now and Wednesday, here's your assignment. I want you to do a pass at a resume. The resume can be two, three, four pages. 
doesn't matter. Cyberspace is limitless. Every resume has four parts. Part number one, basic information, name, email, that sort of stuff. It must have a job objective. What does a job objective say? These skills, this kind of organization in this geographic area. Then it lists your experience. But remember, this is a resume, not a biography. So all the experience has to do is to support the job objective. It must be chronological. You don't need to go back more than 10 years. Finally, education. Seminars, awards, leave it off. Unless the seminar directly pertains to the job objective. If you want to intrigue a job hunter and you've done something unusual, you can talk about the fact that you crude or that you are uh, fluent in six languages. Anything that causes the reader to pick up the phone and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you. Remember that your resume today needs to be much more detailed because the first interview for any job is going to be by phone. There, the chances of getting an in-person interview before a phone interview have gone down tremendously. The resume needs to be spelled, punctuated. It needs to be perfect. So if that is not your strength, could we find a really nitpicky English major who will quarrel over every piece of grammar, spelling, no abbreviations, no None of the words that are used on the web, OMG, all that sort of stuff, no. A resume is a formal document. Now remember that the only thing that we want from this resume is for it to open the door. We don't want it to sell. We just want them to pick up the phone and call you. Therefore, if you choose to put a graphic on your resume, if you choose to put a pie chart showing things you've done, that's great. If you've ever screened resumes, they go on forever and they are boring. And after you've read five, you can't remember what you read in the first one. So anything that makes yours better is a good thing. Now, this is the final test of the resume. Take the job objective, hand it to five friends, take it off the resume and say, what kind of skills should this person have? Then take the body of the resume. That is the experience in education. Pass it to five other friends and say, what kind of job should this person be looking for? And see if they agree. And if you don't get internal consistency there, you need to rewrite. So we have two questions about resumes. One, how long should a resume ideally be? And two, um, how can you de-emphasize that you have so much work experience? What would you recommend in terms of editing down? Okay. Editing down, number one, we never go back more than 10 years, whether you've worked 50 years or you've worked 20 years, 10 years, because you would find very few people that think there was life before 2000. So don't even worry about that. The resume should be not more than three pages. If you're going to more than three pages, you're doing a vita, not a resume. And the way in which people read resumes, they look at the job objective, then they flip to the bottom of the resume, and they look at the education. Then they come back and start reading. Don't do a summary. Summaries are deadly. Let people get right into your experience and your accomplishments early on, in the first 20 seconds when they come back. The other thing about resumes is when you put things on a resume. You always want to put the result. Never just list what you did. Say, um, managed, led the team that, whatever it is. And then say results and list a couple of results. If you do that for everything you've done in the last 10 years, people will not care what you did in the previous time. I had a client once who was national champion from a school in this area, an NCAA champion swimmer. And he got so paranoid about his age that he told the university he lost his championship ring and he paid to get another one with a date 10 years earlier. 
10 years later and then when he'd actually been a swimming champion. That's nuts. What you want to do is to be as straightforward as possible, to be everything on your resume has got to be a fact. It's got to be checkable. It's got to match your LinkedIn profile. You don't have to tell everything, but anything you put on the resume has got to be verifiable. I have a friend who's a headhunter, and she would t say that 60% of the people put stuff on their resume that is not true. And don't even go there. You don't want to even think about that. So can we ask one last question? We had someone ask about what if you have a gap on your resume that is about 10 years? So the last thing that you have to show is from before people thought there was actual life. Then I would explain the gap. Home rearing children, uh, off doing missionary work in Africa, whatever. I would not even think about trying to disguise that. Anything that you do that seems faintly dishonest makes people doubt your credibility. And when somebody says, well, you were home with your children 10 years, yes, don't apologize. Say yes, and now I'm back and ready to go at it full tilt. I, I would never apologize for a choice I made. That makes me seem not completely honest. All right, so we have reached the end of the hour. Um, a lot of questions came in right at the end, and I want you to know that I've hung on to them and will be sending them to Marilyn so that she can start off next time, um, this next Wednesday, going over a quick review of what we talked about today and also addressing some of those questions. So um, I want you to know that we have them, and we will definitely get to them. And, and we will be sending out an email as well that has a link to this uh, program. Um, you'll be able to follow the link and, and download the recording of the webinar. So if anything comes up between now and then, please feel free to send us a note back. Uh, we'll also have a survey so that we can get your feedback from this session so we can apply it for Wednesday the 20th and then the following Wednesday on the 27th as well. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to Wednesday. Thank you so much, Marilyn.